Good afternoon. This is a lecture on pelvic physiotherapy, and the question is, are Kegels appropriate for everyone? The objective of this lecture is to define pelvic floor physiotherapy and to identify the appropriate candidates for pelvic floor physiotherapy. Essentially, we want to figure out what Kegels are and are they appropriate for everyone. Um, in the discussion of Kegels, we are going to assess whether or not um, clinicians consider a hypertonic or a hypotonic pelvic floor when um, given, giving uh, Kegels to patients as an exercise form. We want to look at the evidence with regards to pelvic floor physiotherapy. What is pelvic health physiotherapy? Pelvic health physiotherapy is the assessment of the pelvic floor muscles as they contribute to incontinence, constipation, pelvic pain, and pelvic organ prolapse. It involves the digital, vaginal, and rectal examination of the pelvic floor muscles, but it also includes a comprehensive orthopedic assessment. We are not able to just consider the pelvic floor at a patient's presentation without considering other orthopedic uh, contributing factors. Uh, on the other hand, we should not be doing orthopedic assessment on patients without considering the pelvic floor as a contributing uh, element to the patient's presentation. So why doesn't this happen on a regular basis? Well, certainly there's a lack of training in medical school, physiotherapy, uh, postgraduate education, midwifery programs, and nursing programs. I've recently taught at a local uh, Canadian university in which all four of those student groups were present at this uh, discussion. None of these student groups were currently being trained uh, in the appropriate assessment by uh, digital palpation of the pelvic floor for strength and hypertonicity. We should recognize that Kegels are not a one-size-fits-all exercise, which means that if people have a pelvic problem, the first solution should not be to give them Kegels. We need to recognize as well that incontinence and pelvic pain are very private, personal, and underreported problems, and we'll look at the statistics of that. There's this huge misconception in our society that has been perpetuated by the medical um, system that incontinence is an inevitable part of aging. Good uh, solutions for incontinence have not been offered to patients, even though there is level one brain rate evidence of um, that physiotherapy is, is a very effective way of dealing with incontinence. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. There's also a lack of funding, and this really affects um, Ontario and the Canadian healthcare system, but I think it's also a worldwide problem. Let's look at incontinence and pelvic pain specifically. How common are they? Well, one in four women in Canada report incontinence, and one in nine men report incontinence. If we look at endometriosis, which is the most common form of pelvic pain, 10% of women um, report endometrial pain. This is according to an Australian white paper um, published in 2011. There's a new study that was actually just published on female pelvic pain in 2013 that looked at 2,000 college students in the United States. Um, it was a, a mail-out survey, and they received 400 replies on the survey. Of those 400 replies, 72% of young women, these are college-educated women, reported pelvic pain uh, with intercourse. And 75% of those women had never spoken to a medical professional about it. The reality is that this is a serious problem. The statistics now say that 50% of us will end our life in diapers. And a significant part of that is due to pelvic floor dysfunction. As physiotherapists, pelvic floor function and muscle function is part of our um, culture and is part of our expertise. And I think this um, area we are largely responsible for. Let's talk about this concept of a lack of medical training uh, in assessment. There is excellent ev evidence in the literature to suggest that palpation-based training of the pelvic floor has good support. Uh, the Cochrane Collaboration, um, uh, Chantal Dumoulin and her partner uh, created a review in 2010 that looked at all the evidence behind pelvic floor muscle training in incontinence. And they looked at mixed incontinence, so both stress incontinence and urge incontinence. 
and concluded that there was level one evidence that approximately 80% of women who underwent uh, conservative care by training the pelvic floor um, had a marked or significant improvement in their continence. Right now in Canada, the majority of those women who have stress incontinence will be offered um, a surgical procedure such as a TVT. Um, right now in Canada, that it is not common to see those women being offered pelvic floor physiotherapy as a uh, entry point into a surgical consult. Is there good evidence that when we palpate internally that we have um, good intertester and intratester reliability? Elena Frawley did a study in 2005 and found that there's 79% complete agreement in quick line um, and supine using the six point um, modified Oxford scale for muscle testing. And we'll go over that in a minute. So, the muscle testing scale for pelvic floor muscle training and assessment is the same uh, Oxford scale that we use for manual muscle testing in other areas. And the grade one indicates that there's just a flicker of, of movement in the pelvic floor. How you assess the pelvic floor is to insert two fingers and your fingers are just resting gently against the pelvic floor muscles um, at between the first and second uh, knuckle of your fingers, uh, the DOP and the PNOP. And with your fingers just gently resting against the pubovaginalis muscle, you, if you feel a flicker on, to com on command of doing a pelvic floor contraction, you are given a grade one. If you can actually feel them squeeze a little bit against your fingers, but there's no lift or drawing of the fingers inside, then you would grade them a two. If there's actually a tightening of the pelvic floor and a lift inside, they would um, receive a grade three. And a grade four and five uh, is graded based on the amount of resistance that you can give uh, with your fingers to their muscles. It's very important when you're manual muscle testing that you don't actually give them resistance until they start to contract because you don't want to put their muscles on a stretch uh, before they're able to generate any force. <clears throat> so the concept that digital palpation uh, needs to occur in order to train muscles is not only important to be able to grade the muscles and to get a sense of whether or not they are weak, but also to look at the concept of um, whether the muscle is actually too tight. And if there's hypertonicity present in the muscle, we would not want to be training that muscle in the same way as if there's hypotonicity or weakness contributing to that patient's problem. And this is something that we understand um, globally in other muscle areas um, of the body, but has not been considered except for perhaps the last 10 years uh, with regards to pelvic floor training. The Society of OBGYNs in Canada um, have come up with a practice statement as well in 2008 that indicate that pelvic floor training should be done with digital palpation or biofeedback. So randomly, we should just not ask patients to squeeze these muscles as if stopping in midstream urine and hope for the best of uh, uh, luck for the patient to figure out where these muscles are and what they're doing. So why is it important um, for Kegels not to be taught without an internal exam? Well, first of all, um, the pelvic floor has poor proprioceptive um, organs in it. So we do not have tendons uh, in the pelvic floor in the same way as we have tendons in our quadricep muscles or other um, uh, peripheral muscles. And because we don't have tendons, we don't have Golgi tendon organs. And so our, our proprioceptive um, structures are quite different in the pelvic floor. These muscles are internal, so we have poor visual and tactile connection with them. Um, think about going to the gym and working out. We tend to use the mirrors in front of us to give us a sense of feedback and what we're doing, and we don't have this feedback in the pelvic floor. And then, of course, we've been talking a little bit about whether these muscles are hypotonic or hypotonic, and that is very important as well to assess before um, we consider uh, pelvic floor muscle training or any other appropriate treatment for pelvic floor problems. Okay, so this is a tutorial on the pelvic floor. So what we're looking at here is a superior view into the pelvis, and you can see these muscles which make up the pelvic floor at the bottom of the pelvis. So 
I've got the femurs in here because I've included the muscles of the walls of the pelvis. So you've got the piriformis muscles attaching to the sacrum and to the greater trochanter of the femur. And you've got the obturator internus muscles, which you can see here. And again, he will take you through this lecture. If I rotate round to the back, you can see the uh, tendon of the obturator internus muscle attaching to the femur. So those two muscles make up the walls of part of the walls of the um, of the pelvis. So the pelvic floor separates the pelvic cavity above from the perineum below, and it consists of the pelvic diaphragm, and then you've got the perineal membrane and the deep perineal pouch. So the the word pelvic diaphragm is often used interchangeably for pelvic floor. But in this tutorial, I'm going to talk about the pelvic diaphragm in relation to two specific muscles. And then I'll go on to tell you about the perineal membrane and the deep perineal pouch. So these three structures combined make up the pelvic floor. So to begin with, I'm going to talk about the pelvic diaphragm. So the pelvic diaphragm is this dome-shaped um, set of structures which we're looking down at and it consists of the levator ani muscles on either side so you've got this midline raf this ligamentous midline where the two halves of the levator ani muscle attach and you've got the coccygeus muscle which is this muscle here so i've just isolated the um, the pelvic diaphragm muscles and you can see the shape of them here it's like this this bowl shape of muscles so ignore this extension up here as the the muscle doesn't actually extend this far up so just bear that in mind so it has its anterior attachment on the posterior surface of the pubis here and then it attaches along the fascia of the obturator internus muscle and then at the back it attaches to the coccyx and it meets in the midline to form this midline raf. So this is where the, the levator ani meets in the midline, posterior to the anus, which is this um, aperture here. So anteriorly, you can see that the levator ani muscle has this defect. It's got this U-shaped defect. And this is called the urogenital hiatus. And this allows the um, urogenital apparatus to pass through the pelvic floor into the perineum below. So in males you get the passage of the urethra and in females you get passage of the urethra and the vagina through this urogenital hiatus. And as you can see the muscle consists of various different um, fibres. So you've got these loops of fibres which loop around various structures. So the levator ani muscle is typically thought of in terms of three sets of fibres. So you've got the pubococcygeus, which attaches from the bony bit of the pubis and extends back to the coccyx. So you've got the coccyx at the, at the back here. And then it's got some anterior, the anterior fibres of the pubococcygeus actually loop around the prostate in males and the vagina in females. So you've got these anterior fibres which are divided and loop around the prostate in males forming the levator prostatae or the puboprostaticus and in females it loops around the vagina forming the pubovaginalis and then in the midline as I mentioned before connecting from the coccyx down to the anus so remember this is the aperture for the anus so connecting from the coccyx to the anus you've got this midline raf this ligament which is called the anococcygeal ligament or anococcygeal body and then the next part of the levator ani muscle is this puborectalis muscle. So I'm going to draw this on in green, outline it in green. And this forms a sling around the distal end of the gastrointestinal tract, so around the sort of anus and rectum, around the anorectal junction. So you've got this sling of muscle from the levator ani forming around the um, anorectal junction. So these are the intermediate fibres of the levator ani, and they 
again originate on the pubis and they have the important function of maintaining this anorectal angle so they keep this angle of 90 degrees which closes off the anal canal and I'll come on to talk about this in a moment and then we've got the posterior fibers of the levator ani muscle and these are called the iliocoxygeus muscles or fibers so you've got these which I'm outlining in purple. So those are the three collections of fibers which make up the levator ani muscle. So this muscle forms the bulk of the pelvic diaphragm. So just to quickly recap, the levator ani is composed of these three collections of muscle fibers and if we rotate the model around you can see the origin of the levator ani on the posterior surface of the pubis and then it's got this origin along the the border of the obturator internus muscle so covering the obturator internus is this fascia and you've got this thickening so you can see this white thickening this is a tendinous thickening called the tendinous arch and this is the thickening of the fascia where the levator ani takes part of its origin and then over here we've got the ischial spine so along this line from the body of the pubis along this tendinous arch to the spine of the ischium the ischial spine the levator ani takes its origin and then it inserts on the coccyx and in the midline at this anococcygeal ligament so if we just rotate to an inferior view you can see these muscles taking their attachment on their little coccyx and you've got this perineal body which is a fibromuscular connective tissue node which joins the perineum and the pelvic floor and you've got some convergence of the levator ani muscles on this node. So the function of the levator ani muscle is to support the pelvic viscera and it keeps the rectum and vagina closed so it has this kind of sphincter closing action on the rectum and the vagina and importantly it resists rises in intrapelvic pressure during any straining so for example during coughing when the abdominal muscles increase the intrapelvic pressure it resists this rise and prevents anything being evacuated from the digestive tract. So one thing I mentioned was that the puborectalis maintains this anorectal angle so you've got this angle between the rectum and the anal canal and the puborectalis loops around this and and it keeps this angle so by maintaining this angle it sort of forms this valve which stops the anal canal filling with feces from the rectum so when this muscle relaxes and releases its tension on this angle the angle between the rectum and anal ca canal increases and it becomes more like this so then you don't get this pinching off of the anal canal and feces can flow from the rectum into the anal canal. So this is important in defecation. So you need to be able to relax the pelvic diaphragm muscles, in particular the puborectalis portion of this muscle, in order to relax this anorectal angle and prevent shutting off of the anal canal. So the other muscle of the pelvic diaphragm is the coccygeus, which you can see here on either side. So this muscle lies over the sacrospinous ligament. So if I rotate it around to the back, you can see this ligament connecting the sacrum to the ischial spine. So it lies over the sacrospinous ligament. And it forms the posterior part of the pelvic diaphragm. So it originates on this ischial spine and it inserts laterally on the coccyx and the adjacent margins of the sacrum. So if I just rotate around to the back, you can see its insertion along the margins of the sacrum and the coccyx below. So this muscle um, functions to support the pelvic floor and it's innervated by branches from the anterior rami of S4 and S5. So the levator ani muscle is actually innervated by branches of the pudendal nerve from roots S2 to S4. So you've got that useful mnemonic S234 keeps shit off the floor. So it describes kind of the function of the levator ani muscle. 
So we've talked about the pelvic diaphragm now in quite a lot of detail. So the next part of the pelvic floor is the perineal membrane and the deep perineal pouch. Moving on to the next slide, um, it's important to understand that the pelvic floor muscles have five very important functions. It's also important to note that there is no other muscle in the body that actually has five important functions um, associated with it. So again, training of these muscles specifically um, is very important. These muscles have a sphincteric function. In other words, they, they close the bladder and bowel and keep our um, urine and, and feces off the floor, literally, or out of our underwear in the toilet when appropriate. Um, they provide support uh, to our organs inside. So again, they, uh, good pelvic floor strength will help to minimize the chance of pelvic organ prolapse. We have a very important sexual function. Without pelvic floor muscles, we have, we have difficulty um, orgasming. Pelvic floor muscles um, have a very important structural function and contribute to uh, low back pain. And we'll look at this a little bit later in this talk, as well as hip pain. And they have an, an important sump pump function. And by that I mean that the pelvic floor muscles help to bring uh, lymph and, and venous return blood from the legs back into the trunk again. We have to recognize that um, this is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I think we're, we're quite familiar with this um, pictorial. And if we look at what the basic functions of of survival are. Uh, it's physiological homeostasis. So breathing, food, water, excretion, elimination, uh, sex, and sleep. When these most basic functions are lost, we are not only lo losing um, the function itself, but our primary reward system. It's interesting, we should think about elimination and sex not only to be functional, that we should be able to do it without pain or difficulty, but that they should be rewarding and fun. Melissa Farmer brought that to um, a presentation in 2013, and I thought that was something very important to consider with our patients. It's not okay to just ignore this part of the body, and yet as physiotherapists, that's exactly what we do. Or we gloss over it by just giving them um, a simple exercise and, again, hope for the best. Um, on Twitter, uh, Todd Hargrove, a physical therapist in the United States, actually um, said very cleverly, I thought, that sex avoiding should be yes susceptive, not no susceptive. And so again, with pain and discomfort in this area, it is something that we need to take very seriously because our patients cannot build through the rest of their life into safety, love and belonging, esteem, and then ultimately self-actualization if this bottom rung um, is not functional and functional in a way that's pleasurable. All right, pelvic health physiotherapists assess the integrity of the pelvic floor to determine if these muscles are hypotonic, which means weak, or hypertonic, which means too tight, or if they are indeed healthy tissues. If indeed the muscles are weak and dysfunctional, we may see those muscles leading to an array of problems such as um, stress urinary incontinence, sometimes urge incontinence, and pelvic organ prolapse, as well as chronic low back pain. If the muscles are hypertonic, okay, then we may see them lead to a number of pain conditions, and we'll talk about those shortly. So let's talk about hypotonicity first and whether or not Kegels would be appropriate for this patient group. So what are Kegels? Well, Dr. Arnold Kegel was the first uh, physician in the 1940s, he was an OBGYN, who decided that women really needed to exercise their pelvic floors postpartum. He used a perineometer, which is a squeeze pressure device that will objectively measure pelvic floor strength. However, the problem with this device is it also measures intra-abdominal pressure. So it's not very specific, and um, it does not also tell whether or not you're using your abdominals or your glutes to squeeze that device. So again, our fingers actually um, give us much more information, and again, our fingers also tell us whether there's hypertonicity present, in which case, if that is the case, we would not want to be strengthening 
on the Rat Women's Private School. He did use palpation in the 1940s. That's how he taught women how to do pelvic floor muscle contractions. And uh, somehow, though, we have uh, gone away from that and we've digressed. And right now, the state of pelvic floor muscle training is that it's mostly verbal cueing with no palpatory feedback. Uh, we're telling women to stop in midstream kneeling, which for women really gets them to focus on their front triangle or the ability to um, just squeeze the urethra or the vagina. Um, and most women forget that their pelvic floor is also very posterior. It's in the rectal um, uh, region as well, in the posterior triangle, and that these muscles must squeeze to lift the pelvic floor. That's very important. The other thing that women have been told often is that they can just do a few contractions here or there, do a few at the stop sign, do a few at the kitchen counter, just whenever you think about it, squeeze three to five times. Well, unfortunately, this is not good uh, muscle-based physiology training, and so we have to look at these muscles as any other muscle group. If we were going to go to the gym to strengthen our biceps, we would do three sets of ten. When we look at the literature done on pelvic floor muscle training, it is done on approximately 30 repetitions, completed all at once so that we get muscle fatigue. And this is how we have to build um, a muscle strengthening program for women with uh, incontinence. So what is pelvic floor muscle training? Well, it requires specially trained physiotherapists. In Ontario, um, the College of Physiotherapists uh, protects the act of doing an internal exam and physiotherapists must be rostered and trained um, in a postgraduate setting to do an internal exam. Many orthopedic physiotherapists, so physiotherapists who deal with um, the body from a muscle joint perspective, which I consider pelvic health physiotherapists to be in that realm. In fact, I, I believe that pelvic health physiotherapy should really fall under the purvey of orthopedic um, physiotherapy and not so much women's health per se. Um, because the principles are, are the very same. The only difference is, is that pelvic health physiotherapy is uh, like physiotherapy in a cave, basically. You can't see, so you have to use your fingers, but the principles are the same principles as we use in orthopedic physiotherapy. Most orthopedic physiotherapists um, do not do an internal exam. Again, they are just um, giving, patient, giving patients cues such as um, squeeze these muscles as if stopping in midstream there. It's interesting. I think the other thing we should note is that there is no other part of the body that we treat without assessing first. And in fact, if we did, if we were going to assess a knee joint, for example, and never took the patient's genes off and did the assessment through a pair of genes, that in all likelihood someone could complain to the college to say that that was in, an inappropriate assessment and our findings and our exercise based on that assessment um, may not be helpful and in fact could potentially be harmful because we didn't get all the information. Somehow though with Kegels this has become an accepted um, form of treatment and again we need to really think about that. If you're not assessing your part you should not be treated. So let's look at evidence in, in pelvic health physiotherapy specifically. And the goal of the rest of this lecture is to really talk about what is the evidence behind pelvic health physiotherapy. We all like to talk about the use of evidence-based practice. And in fact, this was an interesting um, report that was published in British Medical Journal. It was published online and, and it was accessed on October 20, 2011. And what it says is that even though we have been talking about evidence-based practice for the past decade, 59% of all medical interventions, um, and they um, looked at 3,000 different medical interventions in the study, have been shown to be either ineffective or unlikely to be effective, and yet they are prescribed every day by doctors um, as if they were effective. Um, and I don't think we should pick on our medical colleagues here. I think for physiotherapists, that is very true as well, is that we, we talk about evidence-based practice, but a lot of what we practice is not evidence-based, and yet we talk as if it is, okay? Pelvic floor muscle training has some of the strongest evidence behind it in anything that we do from a physiotherapy perspective, and yet we don't follow the evidence um, chain in uh, this treatment program because we fail to do an internal exam. 
if we look at who has a hypotonic pelvic floor, in fact, generally speaking, and again, we cannot go by the diagnosis alone because I've treated many patients whose predominant symptom was stress incontinence who actually had hypertonicity as well as hypertonicity or just hypertonicity alone. So again, I'm going to give you some generalities with regards to diagnosis, but they are not uh, something that you can hang your hat on. So patients who have stress incontinence, uh, which is coughing, laughing, sneezing, and they leak, um, often have a hypotonic pelvic floor. It's about a 50-50 chance if you have urge incontinence. So these are the folks who get a very strong urge to urinate and they can't make it to the bathroom before they start leaking. About 50% of those uh, folks will have a weak pelvic floor and 50% will have a tight pelvic floor. Mixed incontinence um, can be uh, a bit of both or simply a hypotonic pelvic floor and this also affects our prenatal and postpartum patients. If someone has fecal or gas incontinence, um, so stool or gas incontinence, then it often is due to a weak pelvic floor. And pelvic organ prolapse um, is mostly due to weakness of the pelvic floor muscles and suspensory weakness of the ligaments um, that suspend the organ. So it's a, a dual problem. These are, generally speaking, patients who will benefit from being Kegels. So prolapse um, occurs in women who have weak pelvic floors, and it can occur after childbirth, but I've also seen women who've never had children who have a prolapse. So the question really after childbirth is, are women going back to activity um, too quickly? And so unfortunately, at their midwife appointment at six weeks, at their um, follow-up appointment with the gynecologist at six weeks, no one is actually assessing pelvic floor strength. And grade three pelvic floor strength means that they have the ability to squeeze and lift their pelvic floor with, with little resistance. So it should be a bare minimum um, strength before women are encouraged to go back to activities that, call, that involve heel strength. And if we look at one of the most common um, activities that women like to get involved in postpartum to get their bodies back in shape is boot camp. And boot camp is a very aggressive form of um, training. Uh, involves a lot of jumping and heel strike activities. And unfortunately, these women are not being assessed first to determine whether or not their pelvic floor is strong enough to deal with that trauma on their body with that level of vigorous activity. Um, and so we are putting that, these women at risk by not doing that. When we, uh, when we look at training the pelvic floor for treating prolapse of uh, pelvic floor or, or pelvic organs, so the organs that most commonly prolapse are the bladder and the uh, rectum, although you can also see an intestinal prolapse. And you can also see, of course, the uterus prolapse. That's fairly common as well. What we know from the literature, and there was a, stop, uh, a study called the POPPY study. It was presented at the International Continent Society uh, meeting in 2011. Actually won the best abstract award at that, at that conference. This study demonstrated that pelvic floor muscle training is both effective and cost-effective and should be the first line of defense in reducing symptoms associated with pelvic organ prolapse. Uh, physiotherapists can help to retrain uh, a, pel a prolapse by one grade. And in this lecture, we're not going to talk about how to grade a prolapse, but basically if you have a grade two prolapse or less, so grade one or two, uh, training the pelvic floor is a very effective way. And we do that by training posture, lifestyle modification, and specifically pelvic floor muscle training. If they have a grade three or four prolapse, they will likely require a pessary or surgery, um, but they should have pelvic floor muscle training pre and post surgically. And that just makes logical sense if you think about it. If we think about um, someone who has a meniscal problem in their knee and they have significantly reduced range of motion, the surgeon is not going to uh, likely go in and clean up that meniscus until they've regained some of their range of motion and strength in their knee. And orthopedically, we know that if we do some rehab, or we can call it prehab, some rehab prior to surgery, that the surgical outcome is better, and some rehab post-surgically, 
but overall their outcome is better than if they don't do that. And we've accepted that um, orthopedically in, in different joints for many, many years. Uh, in the pelvic floor, unfortunately, the surgery is seen in isolation. They repair the bladder, but the integrity of the muscles and the condition of the muscles is not considered pre and post surgically um, until uh, or at all really. And so what happens is, is that if the sling is put in um, for a pelvic organ prolapse, if the sling is put into muscles that are very um, mushy and hypotonic or even hypertonic, we run into trouble. If they're hypertonic, we often get pain post-surgically, and if they're hypotonic, the sling repair uh, doesn't last. And in fact, the average sling repair now lasts about 5 to 10 years. Uh, Dr. Pauls did a really nice study that was published in 2013, and this is the first study that I've seen to date of this. Um, and what she did was she looked at women who had um, pelvic organ prolapse surgery, and she divided them into two groups randomly. And one group got um, a standard sort of um, postpartum care uh, or post-op uh, care exercise uh, sheet, and the other women had access to, I believe it was six visits with a physiotherapist. And what the study shown is that, um, again, we have long known that physical therapy helps patients who have orthopedic surgeries. And so she looked at the study specifically for, if we retrain the muscles um, after prolapse surgery, does that help? And in fact, what the study showed was that women had much better um, bladder outcomes and sexual outcomes um, when the women participated in a post-op uh, physiotherapy program. So let's look at the evidence for pelvic floor muscle training and incontinence. Well, as I mentioned earlier, the Cochrane Collaboration in 2010 recommended that pelvic floor muscle training be included as the first line of defense, conservative management um, defense for women with stress, urge, or mixed urinary incontinence. So it's level one evidence to support what we do. In 2010, at the International Continence uh, Society meeting in Toronto, um, the British guidelines were presented that said that um, public floor training is the first line of defense against stress or urinary incontinence in Britain, and that in Britain, public floor training must be completed before surgical intervention is considered. So again, they're moving ahead, looking at the research and saying we need to implement this we are not there in Canada yet. When we look at hypotonicity and we look at anal sphincter injuries, particularly grade three or four tears, um, in Ireland there was clinical practice guidelines established for dealing with obstetric anal sphincter injuries in 2012. And their conclusion is, is that all women should be reviewed by a physiotherapist prior to discharge and should be offered physiotherapy and pelvic floor exercises for six to 12 weeks after obstetric anal sphincter injury and repair. And some may require physiotherapy for a longer period of time. The specialist physiotherapist um, may be best placed to consider when physiotherapy should be discontinued. That's a strong statement. And again, I can talk about the Canadian statistics in postpartum care with women who have a grade three, so a tear, a perineal tear to the anal sphincter or through the anal sphincter are not offered standardly um, postpartum care. Again, if we look at the Joint Society of Obstetrics uh, and Gynecologists, um, their practice guidelines very clearly say that uh, initiation of pelvic floor exercise in the immediate postpartum period may reduce the risk of future urinary incontinence, and that this should be done with the physiotherapist, um, and that core strengthening also has um, some benefit to it as well and uh, should be done with a physiotherapist. So what about prenatal training? Does it make sense actually to do pelvic floor muscle training in the prenatal phase? What is the evidence behind that? Well, Salveson et al. in 2004 actually looked at women who trained their pelvic floor between 20 and 36 weeks of pregnancy. What they demonstrated was these women had a lower rate of prolonged second stage labor than women who did no training. So that's the pushing stage. Women pushed more effectively and we're able to transition through that phase more quickly. We also know that getting stuck in the second stage of labor um, using instrumentation such as forceps and uh, suction and a prolonged second stage of labor are risk factors for uh, pelvic floor dysfunction 
later on, so weakness and uh, problems. Women who also trained their pelvic floor in that time frame had less pregnancy-related low back pain and pelvic girdle pain, and they were less likely to have urinary incontinence uh, at 36 weeks of pregnancy and at three months postpartum. So again, this should be standard care. There's good evidence to suggest that women who are trained to contract their pelvic floor muscles um, and to do 30 repetitions a day, um, that this is a very preventative program. Well, what does pelvic floor training look like? Well, because these muscles are inside, often the way a pelvic floor therapist will train the um, patient is to visualize the fact that there are actually two triangles in the pelvic floor. And I'm going to skip your head to the next slide so that you can see the triangles. We have a front triangle called the urogenital triangle and a back triangle called the uh, posterior triangle or the rectal triangle. What's really important for women is that they understand that this whole um, conglomerate of muscles called the pelvic floor um, is used in the pelvic floor muscle contraction and that it's not just vaginal. It's interesting to note that when I assess men, men think it's mostly about their posterior triangle and women think it's more about their anterior triangle. And so it's getting the coordination of those uh, two areas that's important. Uh, a visual cueing, which was created um, by Beat Kerrier in uh, California, um, that I find particularly helpful in my clinical practice is I often start women thinking about these tubes or tunnels that lead from the outside to the inside. And I describe those tubes and tunnels in a way to patients that allow them to start to connect with each area of the pelvic floor. So, for example, I might ask them to imagine that they're drawing a marble into their anus up to their rectum. And because the vagina is a, a larger tube or tunnel, we think about a ping pong ball, drawing a ping pong ball up and in towards the uterus. And because the urethra is very tiny, we also think about drawing a raisin into the urethra and up towards the bladder. And this will start to give them a sense of uh, their pelvic floor. If we stay on this picture for a moment, you can also see the muscle fiber orientation in the pelvic floor. So we've got some muscle fibers oriented from front to back and some muscle fibers oriented from side to side. So one of the things that we'll then do is as they put the pelvic floor together, we'll get them to think about drawing their bones together because essentially that is what muscles do is they draw bones together. If a patient uh, was paralyzed, for example, in their bicep, let's say they had a stroke and they could not uh, conceptualize where their bicep was, one of the things I might do is I might tap the bicep and get them to think about bringing their wrist to their shoulder versus saying to them, contract their bicep. I might get them to uh, the same sort of a cueing and, uh, and training might happen in the pelvic floor. I might say to them, okay, I want you to use your pelvic floor muscles to draw your pubic synthesis, your pubic bone and your tailbone together and then lift them inside. Or if we want to engage the uh, horizontal muscle fibers, we may say to them, okay, I want you to think about drawing your sits bones together and then draw them inside and then let them go. And you're much more likely to get some nice concentric and eccentric training happening in that way. The literature says very clearly that we need to do uh, 30 repetitions uh, once a day and that again we need to do that for a period of time that it takes to retrain muscles um, based on muscle physiology which is about 12 to 16 weeks. So women need to be very diligent in that time frame. So we do have some choices with regards to giving patient options in the uh, prepartum, postpartum, pre-surgical, post-surgical phases with uh, straightforward stress incontinence and urge incontinence and pelvic organ fillings. And each of these areas has good evidence behind them. And so one of the things that we need to ask ourselves as physiotherapists uh, is, are we offering our patients um, best evidence? Going back to that slide from the British Medical Journal, are we just practicing what we know how to practice or are we following the evidence trail and the evidence chain as to how we should train the pelvic floor? And, and now again, I'm specifically talking about the hypotonic pelvic floor. So let's move forward and talk about the hypertonic pelvic floor. So again, with the hypertonic pelvic floor, the question we're trying to answer is, are these patients appropriate for Kegels? Is this a patient group that we should be prescribing Kegels to? Well, on this slide, this is a doc assessing a man's uh, anal sphincter, and obviously it's very tight. And um, 
the medical system with hypertonicity, which causes inflammation and irritation um, in both the pelvic floor and the visceral structures, the organs um, surrounding the pelvic floor, um, the, the medical system has very much medicalized that. So this doc is talking about this as an inflamed prostate, but it's just as likely to be actually hypertonicity in the pelvic floor that's causing that lens pain and not necessarily his prostate. So what kind of symptoms will your patient present with if they have a hypertonic pelvic floor? Well, these are the, the women that have pain during or after intercourse, orgasm, or sexual stimulation. They often have a history of constipation and straining, um, and they may have pain with bowel movements. They often will have burning or itching over their vulva, so this is representative of connective tissue dysfunction. They may present with um, specifically, when we look at connective tissue dysfunction, these are the symptoms that they have, and I'll, I'll let you read through them. Ursula Wesselman is a neurologist and a professor at John Hopkins University who has actually done a series of rat studies looking at this um, concept of a visceral somatic reflex and a somatic visceral reflex. And these are interesting studies that we need to be aware of, um, both medically and in the physiotherapy realm. What she actually did was she injected a pseudorabies virus in the tail of a rat, and with some blue dye. And within two days, that blue dye extravasated into the rat's bladder, and, as did the viral agent. And so there's this reflexive connection um, in the organs between the somatic tissues of the suprapubic area, inner thigh, outer thigh, glutes, and pelvic floor, that when those areas are irritated or tight, they actually irritate the bladder and the, and the visceral organs of the, uh, the pelvic cavity. The opposite happens as well, and so that has also been shown in rats, that if you put blue dye into a rat's bladder or a rat's uterus with, uh, again, a viral agent, within two days that blue dye has extravasated into the, the somatic tissues, the myofascial tissues of the suprapubic, inner thigh, outer thigh, glutes, um, and tail of the rat, and pelvic floor. So again, there's this reflexive connection that when we have uh, visceral irritation, we see muscle tension that goes along with that. And when we have muscle tension, we often see visceral irritation. And so that will help you to start to understand some of the connection that we see um, in interstitial cystitis, for example, which is painful bladder syndrome, or endometriosis, how uh, women with a lot of endometrial tissue will often end up with very hypertonic uh, pelvic floor muscles, suprapubic muscles, lower abdominal muscles, um, and thigh muscles. And this results in connective tissue dysfunction. And uh, Fitzgerald et al. did a nice study in 2012 that identified these conditions and actually set about to treat them. And we'll talk about that study in just a moment. So you will also get the symptoms um, of urinary problems. So typical sort of painful bladder syndrome, uh, frequency, urgency, hesitation, the stopping and starting of the urine stream, painful urination, or incomplete emptying. And um, when their pelvic floors are tight, these are the types of symptoms that you're going to see with, with these patients. Um, unexplained pain in their low back, pelvic region, hips, genital area, rectum, so pelvic girdle pain and low back pain. And often these women are very intolerant to the speculum and that should be one of your first cues. The conditions that we see um, that are consistent with a hypertonic pelvic floor are reoccurrent urinary tract infections. And again, that's based, again, not on uh, true infections, not cultured infections, but the feeling of a urinary tract infection. And again, that has to do with that visceral somatic loop that we just talked about. Um, the history of sexual abuse, I put this in, in brackets because sometimes we think that when women have a hypertonic pelvic floor, they have a higher chance of having a history of sexual abuse in their past. And in fact, it's about one in four, which is the statistic um, uh, for women generally. So we don't see any more abuse in this patient population, but we see, see the same representative uh, level of abuse in this patient population. Um, anybody with a history of pelvic pain or pelvic girdle pain, you need to consider hypertonicity of the pelvic floor in your presentation. Certainly we've talked about endometriosis, which is uh, inflamed and irritated endometrial lesions sitting outside of the, the uterus, interstitial cystitis or painful bladder syndrome, irritable bowel syndrome, and fibromyalgia. So can we actually identify these women clinically? Well, 
the Chicago group did a nice study in 2011, and um, it was a blinded examination, a double-blinded examination, and they looked at 44 patients. And what they were able to show is they were able to identify the women who actually had chronic pelvic pain by two specific tests. They actually did a whole battery of tests with these women, and two specific tests clinically uh, and reliably um, identified these women as having um, uh, chronic pelvic pain. And they were a hypertonic pelvic floor and a positive force phagus uh, test. So again, very easily we can start to, with our clinical exam, identify women who have chronic pelvic pain. I've alluded to the study. Fitzgerald um, et al. did two studies, one in 2009 and one in 2012. 2009 was a pilot study and 2012 was a full study. And um, this is a very difficult study to carry out and they did a fantastic job of looking at um, a standardized protocol for all women. So to be included in the study, you had to have had persistent urological pain for less than three years but greater than three months. And all of these women, irregardless of their actual presentation, um, underwent the same um, form of uh, physical therapy. And so they did connective tissue massage um, between the knees and the rib cage, front and back, and they released uh, certain pelvic floor muscles and certain external muscles. And uh, they compared that treatment group to a generalized massage group. And the outcome of both studies showed that 59% of women in the full trial and 57% of women in the feasibility study uh, responded to physiotherapy interventions, as, uh, as described earlier, addressing tissue dysfunction only, as compared to 26% of people responding to generalized massage. Again, I, I note that, again, it, what they treated was tissue dysfunction specifically. One of the things that we know very clearly at this point about um, pelvic girdle pain and pelvic pain conditions like interstitial cystitis, irritable bowel syndrome, uh, fibromyalgia, is that these patients have a strong central sensitization component. And so this component was not addressed at all in the study. It would have been very difficult at this point to do that. It would be very interesting to run the study again and to actually randomize these uh, women into two groups this time. One that into the group of tissue, uh, treating the tissues as it was done in the study. And the second group looking at treating the tissues and central sensitization. Um, as well, looking at both components and to see if there's a difference. First of all, to see if the study is reproducible for the tissue dysfunction piece, which it probably should be, um, but then also to see if we get a, a larger improvement in women when we add that central component. So this study led to the American Neurological Association in 2010 um, to develop their first ever interstitial cystitis guidelines. And this was um, uh, a very important step in, in starting to manage these women um, differently and better. Uh, women with interstitial cystitis um, have a very poor quality of life. In fact, it's estimated that these women who are living with interstitial cystitis is similar to living with end-stage renal disease, uh, living on dialysis all the time, that that's um, the quality of their life. So the first line of defense, according to the interstitial, uh, interstitial cystitis guidelines, is that they should make diet changes and decrease the irritation of their diet to the bladder, bladder lining and that they need to reduce and manage stress. So again, we looked at the central components and that's very important. The second line of defense, physiotherapy actually is right at the top of that. And in fact, Dr. Robert Muldwin, who is one of the leading researchers in the United States with um, regards to interstitial cystitis, estimates that 75 to 80% of IC pain is related to pelvic floor dysfunction. So again, physiotherapists need to play a key role in the treatment of this condition. The second line of defense also includes medications for uh, central pain mechanisms, such as amitriptyline and Elmeron, which is a, a medication aimed at the bladder lining itself. And then bladder installation medications is also the next line of defense. When we look at pelvic girl pain specifically, we're looking at uh, women predominantly in um, uh, pregnancy and or postpartum phase. This is when pelvic girdle pain really becomes predominant. And these women have difficulty with standing for a long period of time, cycling, walking, prolonged sitting, prolonged lying down, rolling over in bed, 
getting up from a couch or a chair, especially if it's low, walking up and down stairs, so any reciprocal sort of pelvic girdle movement. They often complain of a decreased stride length or a catching feeling in their leg. Okay, so this is sort of the European uh, guidelines of 2008. These are what pelvic girdle pain patients look like on history. Um, the risk for developing pelvic girdle pain in pregnancy um, is if you had a history of low back pain prior to pregnancy, you were much more likely to develop pelvic girdle pain in pregnancy. If you had uh, previous trauma to the pelvis, and if you have a positive P4 thrust test, and that's the test being demonstrated on this slide. So again, if we look at those patients, um, those are the patients that um, also tend to have pelvic floor dysfunction. So we need to look at that in just a moment. So let's look at that a little bit in a little bit more detail. Is there a correlation between pelvic floor problems and low back pain and pelvic girdle pain? Um, and, and yes, clearly in the literature there is. So Eliason did a study in 2008 looking at 200 women with chronic low back pain, and she demonstrated that 78% of them reported pelvic floor dysfunction. Um, Smith and Hodges did a large study in 2006. They actually followed 38,050 women over a five-year period. It was a prospective study done. And we used to believe in the medical community that the strongest two, the two strongest comorbid factors for chronic low back pain were BMI, so body mass index, and inactivity. So our recommendations as a medical community to women with chronic low back pain were lose weight and become more active. And in fact, what this large study showed was that the two strongest comorbidities for chronic low back pain are pelvic floor dysfunction and respiratory dysfunction. So the top and bottom of the canister um, of the core, basically. Okay, And so these are very important muscles and areas to target when we're dealing with chronic low back pain. Then Wingerdin um, and Associates did a, a nice uh, poster study and poster presentation in 2013 at the first uh, Congress on abdominal pelvic pain in Amsterdam. And they did a large study, 1,636 patients. And 63% of women with pelvic girdle pain um, in their study had pelvic floor dysfunction, so two-thirds. And 57% of women had combined low back pain and pelvic girdle pain and pelvic floor dysfunction. So there is a strong association between lumbar pelvic dysfunction and pelvic floor uh, problems or, or, or uh, pelvic floor organ problems. So we really have to start asking the question, you know, could these pelvic floors in pelvic girdle pain and low back pain be weak or tight? And on history, they definitely are presenting with pelvic floor dysfunction. So you really need to ask your low back pain patients, do they have incontinence? Do they have pelvic pain? Do they have dyspareunia, which is painful intercourse? Do they have urgency or frequency? And are they constipated? And if these are the case, then they really need to be seen by a physiotherapist as well who can assess their pelvic floor because it will be contributing to this problem according to evidence-based medicine. Well, does this matter? Um, I think we would all agree that it does. If we look at the statistics on treating back pain throughout the world, we are failing miserably. Um, back pain is the number one cause of global disability. So it's something that we need to think about as physiotherapists. So let's, again, just review the conditions that we've talked about. Um, hypotonic pelvic floors, weak pelvic floors, should have a, have a supervised pelvic floor muscle retraining program. They should only be given if the pelvic floor muscles are weak, and the state of the pelvic floor can only be determined by palpation. Kegels should be taught by palpation as many women cannot find or properly contract these muscles. So telling a woman to contract these muscles without checking is not a helpful way. And again, this is evidence-based medicine. When we talk about hypertonicity, we need to look at the problem much more globally. And in this lecture, I've not been able to give you a good overview of that, but I want you to at least start thinking about, are their pelvic floors tight? And if they are, treating the pelvic floor, releasing the pelvic floor muscles, not training them further by strengthening them, is helpful. We want to teach them to drop or relax their pelvic floor. We have to recognize that these patients present in a bigger context, a bigger picture. They often um, have uh, high levels of catastrophization or faulty beliefs with regards to pain or self-efficacy, their ability to actually control their pain. 
Manual therapy or massage to the internal muscles is very effective as um, evidenced by Fitzgerald studies, as well as connective tissue massage. We talked about the canister being a problem, both uh, respiratory dysfunction and pelvic floor dysfunction, so we need to look at those pieces. And we need to really consider the neuromuscular uh, component to this and retrain uh, the sensory motor cortex using a lot of imagery on or Tai Chi. It's really important in this patient group that if they have a hypertonic pelvic floor that we do not give them Pilates or core strengthening because that is just going to create more hypertensity in those muscles. So again, this whole concept of always checking with your doctor before starting a new exercise program, that's fantastic. But if a patient goes to their MD and says, or to their physio and says, I'd like to start a Pilates program, is anyone checking the pelvic floor or asking those questions to know that they're actually hypertonic on history and they should not be doing a Pilates program? So to see whether or not, I've ho I hope I've um, got you thinking. I hope that I've stimulated some discussion, um, both for yourself but with your colleagues, to look at this uh, question more seriously. I also hope that you consider the bigger context of the patient, that these muscles are very important for basic physiological functioning, and leaving a patient with poorly rehabilitated pelvic floor muscles is actually doing them a great disservice. It's interesting to note that in some countries in the world, for example in France, every woman is offered six postnatal pelvic physiotherapy appointments as a preventative strategy against pelvic floor dysfunction. So I think we have a long ways to go. This should form a, the basic um, level of care offered to women in the postpartum phase, and yet, and that's what the evidence states, and yet that's not what's happening. So who is appropriate specifically for pelvic health physiotherapy? Well, really all incontinence patients, um, all post-surgical patients, including C-section patients. That creates a lot of scarring in the low abdominal wall and can create adherence around the bladder. It can create um, tension in the um, abdominal muscles, which then can create sensitization to the organs through the visceral somatic reflex. Patients who have a prolapse, all women with a third or fourth degree external anal sphincter tear, so post um, postpartum complications, all pelvic pain patients who have a hypertonic pelvic floor and a positive Fabers test. So I'm really going to encourage you to use evidence-based medicine to guide your assessment and treatment of incontinence and pelvic pain. In Ontario, we have created a teaching company to start to educate physiotherapists within Ontario and Canada. Um, we also teach nurse continence advisors, doctors, midwives, how to palpate the pelvic floor. We can do just a, a one-hour lecture similar to this, but we also do three to, um, three to eight hour training sessions um, on completing pelvic floor exams and how to teach Kegels for all healthcare professionals so that we are all giving patients um, evidence-based care um, in our practice. If there's any questions or comments about that, please go to our website at www.pelvichealthsolutions.ca. And I've given you as well several studies to consider um, on your journey into pelvic health. Thank you for listening.